I had seen a photo of my ex-husband and he was out living his actual best life. And I was mad. I was so mad because here I was doing the work, far away, frustrated, mad. God, why? And I felt like the Holy Spirit told me to go to the beach. Or maybe that was me. Could have been both. Drive down to the beach. I'm sitting on the beach and I remember Holly's story. And I felt this, what are you grateful for? Because if you don't find something to be grateful for right now, this is about to take over. And it was that same wrestle. And I think if we're all honest, complaining, anger, yeah. madness, grumbling, it's all protecting oh, yeah. disappointment. So you guys remember um, the pandemic that we had? No, you were, no, really. <laughs> you were all there, correct? Right? Was there a pandemic? I, okay, you know. okay. We've, we've forgotten that part of our brain. Yeah, yeah. Honestly, me too. Um, but I remember uh, I was living in America at the time and later that year, uh, my granddad, his health was declining and my dad asked me, hey, would you come back to Australia for a while and, and just spend Christmas with us and spend some time? And I said, you guys are going into summer. And at that point, the pandemic hadn't hit Australia. And so I was like, that sounds great because it's also summer and I want to get out of my house. I love it. I was one of the people that had to do a two week quarantine oh, wow. in a hotel room before you could come, come into the country. Oh, wow. And so in theory- Oh no, what's like once you're in the country, you had to be in a hotel room in Sydney or wherever for, for two- For two weeks okay, to be it. able to quarantine before I could come into like mm -hmm. right. society, right. <laughs> if you will. Wow. Um, and so in theory, I was like, okay, I understand. They're trying to protect, I, I get it. And so I remember flying into Australia and being guarded on the bus to the hotel, sanctioned a soldier. Someone walked me to um, my hotel room, closed the door. There would be meals three times a day. They'd knock on your door and you yeah. had to wait 30 seconds. What it didn't realize was how difficult it would actually be to be alone. Mm -hmm. And so the second the door closes, something hit me and I was like, oh, I'm not coming out of here for 14 days. And I don't know what it was. I was there. I went to sleep that first night, waking up the next morning, something just came over me and I was really upset wow. and I found myself ruminating on these thoughts of, I can't believe I'm here. Mm -hmm. I'm here for my family and now I have to be locked away. I can't talk to anyone. My mom came later that day to drop me a pack care package and I saw her from my room and the pain of not having seen her in real life for like two years mm -hmm. and then to see her through a window. Oh, wow. So it wasn't that I wasn't in a really like sad situation. Like it was pretty sad. It's not the worst situation I've been right. in my life. And I'm sure people watching have been in worse situations. But I noticed what happened to me as I ruminated on these thoughts mm. of how my actual experience was different to my expectations. Yes. Yeah. And that gap there was causing a lot of complaining. I was just going over and over of poor me. I can't believe I have to do 14 days of this. And I'm telling you, 12 hours in, I was lying on my bed, bawling my wow. eyes out. Mm -hmm you would have thought I was Job. Like you actually would have thought that the Lord had taken everything from me in my life. And I FaceTimed my mom and I was like, mom, I actually can't do this. I think I, I actually think I have to go home. Like that is in the space of 12 hours. I went from let's do a viral reel to I'm flying back to America. Wow. And my mom said, honey, if I can, I think you need to be careful about how much you're complaining. Wow. And she said, it's not that it's not even justified. It's just not going to help you. Wow. Yeah. 14 here, days. Yeah. Thanks, mom. The time length isn't going to change, but your experience will. Wow. And so I sat on that. I prayed about it and I was like, okay, if I have 14 days here, what am I doing about it? Yeah. The rest of the 14 days, it was completely different. Wow. Nothing changed. Mm -hmm. Just yeah. what came out of my mouth, what mm -hmm. I was ruminating on. Mm -hmm. And I was realizing it right now, all week we were talking about the power of our words. But I think for me, sometimes my biggest spirals are when I let myself go yeah. down that road of yeah. this isn't fair and woe yeah. is me. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not yeah. even that the situation is a good one. It might be justifiably bad, right. Right. but I'm making it worse by what I'm ruminating on. Yeah. Wow. And the verse, there's a verse in Philippians 2.14 oh. and, and it says, do everything without complaining and arguing. How's that working out for you? Yeah. It's not going great, Holly. It's not going great, actually. Um, and it's just, it's not even one we have to read into. There's no gray area. Yeah. There's no context. Yeah. Yeah. There's what no, do you mean? What did yeah. they really mean when they were saying that? The Greek What's the Greek? Yeah. yeah. What, who was he speaking to, you know? No, no, no. Do everything without complaining and arguing. So I think about the amount of times in my blessed and fortunate life. Yeah. 
that I have these, what we would coin this phrase of like a first world problem of like when you compare it to everything, it's nothing. But we were talking about how much it can ruin your day just by ruminating on it. You know, when your experience doesn't match your expectation, it is so easy to sit in disappointment. And I've been there so many times. I feel like the story of my life has been a story of waiting and waiting on the promises of God. And maybe you identify with that as well. And I just want to encourage you that that God will never fail you. He will never leave you. His, His ways are so much higher than our ways. His thoughts are so much higher than our thoughts. And the reason I experience disappointment often is because in my own mind, I've made a plan and I've got an idea of how all of this should play out. But I forget that the scripture tells me that in his heart, a man plants his course, but the Lord determines his steps. I think I make great plans, but God's plans really are better. And hindsight is 2020, but I can tell you this, I'm still in seasons of waiting in my life. I'm still waiting for some of the promises of God, but I've also lived a lo- enough life now that I've been able to see the faithfulness of God, the goodness of God in the land of the living. I've seen God be so faithful to His Word and His promises. So can I just encourage you in the waiting? Could you trust Jesus? I know you've got a plan in your own mind. I know you've got an idea of how it should all work out, but could you surrender that to Him today? Could you say, God, I trust you and I'm choosing you today because I promise you, He won't disappoint you. There's a story in Numbers where Moses sends these spies to check out the promised land and mm-hmm. they're going to Canaan. And he says, hey, this is the land. God brought us out of out of slavery to mm-hmm. Egypt. Now go and check out this promised land. Yep. He promised us this land flowing with milk and honey. Sends the 12 spies out there and because of their mindset, yep. it yep. says they begin to murmur and size up the land yep. according to themselves. Wow. Their complaining happened when they started to see their reality and where their expectation was. Moses never asked them to size themselves up. He never asked them to presume or assume on God. He asked them to spy out the land. Right. And they came back and they said, there's no way. Yep. They actually started to list off all the promises of God. And then they say, nevertheless, mm-hmm. we can't take this land. And then they start romanticizing the past and they say, chapter 14, they start to say to Moses, why is the Lord bringing us to this land to fall by the sword? Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? Wow. And I've just noticed in my life that my complaining is usually steeped in some kind of comparison or offense. Yeah, that's great. But it causes me to romanticize a past that I willingly walked away from. I romanticize a past that God rescued me from. Whether we're looking at a marriage that God saved me from, whether it was God transitioning me into a new season and I'm looking back on the old season and suddenly because my expectation doesn't meet my reality, I'm complaining, but it's never gone well for me. I don't know if you guys maybe have a moment where complaining, it hasn't changed what's happening, but it certainly changes the experience. Listen, when my husband was in that hospital, when they said that he was going to die, that, you know, nothing was going to get better and he ended up getting better and he went to the rehab center and he was paralyzed from his neck down. And they used to have to put him up in this Hoyer lift to get him up to sit in a wow. chair or do whatever they needed to do with him. I learned how to work that Hoyer lift. I became the nurse. Wow. I didn't need them to come in there and do certain things. I remember putting him up in that lift, setting him in the chair, went to the store, got some crab legs, and we had a date night. Took a towel, laid it on the mm-hmm. table, you know, said, hey, it's date night. You know, I cracked the crabs and I fed him to him crab legs or whatever. And we laughed and we talked because we were determined not to allow that Mm -hmm. moment Mm -hmm. to ruin the rest of our life. I knew it wasn't a permanent situation. It's like, so why complain? It's not going to change anything. Even the scripture talks about it's not going to add anything to us. Mm -hmm. You know, we sit there and complain and wish and hope certain things all you want. It's like, but at the same time, we're losing, you know, opportunities to create new memories or to create things that really, you know, mean something to us. There's this guy named Dr. Dale Robbins, and he wrote this. He said, I used to think people complained because they had a lot of problems, but I've come to realize that they have problems because they complain. Wow. Wow. Our complaining doesn't change anything. It just spreads discontent and discord and makes us miserable. Yeah. Yeah. And I even think like in a, Psalm 77, David said, I 
complained and my spirit was overwhelmed. Yes. So maybe the reason we're feeling overwhelmed is because we're so busy complaining. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Right? Complaining, 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 right? It won't produce anything. Why do you sit there and complain and waste and miss so many moments? God says, regardless of how much you complain, it won't add any stature to you. You can sit back and you can worry all you want to, but you will never get that time back. So why don't you take change that really and turn your complaining into complimenting the creator who have created you to live in this moment. I loved how you said, um, I think you said your experience didn't meet your expectation. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I've been saying for the past handful of years, because when we first moved to California to, to start the church, um, we were just so frustrated because it didn't look like everything, all the vision, you know, mm -hmm. you have um, just crazy big vision of what God's going to do and how it's going to play <laughs> out. And when my experience didn't meet, meet my expectation, there was so much disappointment. Mm -hmm. And I find that the disappointment settles in in that, in those waiting periods. And that for me, it's the, the waiting periods, which you were waiting that are so easy to find myself complaining yeah. because I'm just discouraged and disappointed and frustrated. The thing with complaining too, is it doesn't just affect me. It affects everybody, everybody around. It affects changes everybody. The atmosphere. It changes yes. the atmosphere. And we're actually responsible for the atmosphere. Yes. Right? God put us on planet earth to make a difference, to be salt and light. Right. That's how we're here, right? To right. be the influencer. And I feel like we are. We're being the influencer, but not in the right way. Not yeah. the right right? Way. We're so busy complaining and infighting. Yeah. And it's not it's not helpful. And so I just think if we begin to understand the weight of our words, that we're actually supposed to use our words like God did mm -hmm. to create. Create. Yeah. Right? As opposed to, to tear create down in our world. And, right. And mm -hmm. Exactly. You know, it's easy to see what you see. But the work is seeing what you want to see. So when you learn how to keep your eyes focused on the promises of God and what God has already created for you, knowing that the promises of God are yes and amen, if I can keep my focus on that, I know that there is an opportunity for it to manifest. So now I'm not going to complain about it. I'm going to praise about it. So when you're going through whatever it is that you're going through, keep your eyes on a promise and thank God for the promises. We overcome grumbling just by keeping our mouths shut and maybe making a change, giving an exchange to God. Instead of murmuring, say something that you're thankful about. And the more you do that, the easier it's going to get. And all of a sudden, you're going to create because you're sowing seeds of of good word. You're going to reap from that. And it's going to get easier and easier. And it's going to be better for your life because you're sowing good seeds from your mouth. This passage in Philippians yeah. is one of my absolute favorites for a bunch of reasons, but I was reading it through today before we came into studio. I don't know if you've ever in your life been tempted to say, you know, technically that's not my job, you know? Yeah. So when Paul's writing this letter to church in Philippi, and he it includes something that was known to people, like we'd include the lyrics of a worship song or something, but it's, it's called a Christological hymn, and it comes in Philippians 2. But if anybody in the universe could ever have said, this is not my job, yep. it would have been yeah, Jesus. Yes. So, do you mind if I read this? It's like, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. When I think of how Christ, and I can't, I mean, I, my human mind, yeah. I can't get it, but the little bit I can get that Christ was willing to leave that glory of heaven, yeah. the worship of all the angels, everything, and be born in 
You know, when I think of that tiny baby opening his eyes in Bethlehem, grace awoke, you know, and it's like he did all of that, mistreated, mishandled, doing everything, misunderstood, rejected, betrayed by somebody that's traveled with you for three years. Yeah. And there's nothing worse than being betrayed by somebody who's a brother or sister in the faith, because you think of all the people, I never thought you would be the one to stab me in the back. And still on that night when he was betrayed, he washed Judas's feet before Judas got up and said, I'm done. I'm done with you. And I think there's I would never, ever, ever, ever have the right to say, this isn't really my job. Wow. There was a moment I remember the other day where I was having a conflict in ministry and I was telling Holly about it for the 10th time (laughs) that day. Um, And we were on FaceTime because I was in Australia at the time. And I remember being like, it's just not fair. How do they not get it? And she was like, I know. She Mm -hmm. said, but it's also not helping you to keep going over the narrative Mm -hmm. in your head of what happened. Right. And I think the more we're trying to process, especially the ones we love so much that hurt us, that betray Mm -hmm. us, that that genuinely do wrong against us. No one's saying they're not, but it's like that whole unforgiveness thing of like, you're keeping yourself in the prison when you have the key. Yeah. Complaining is the same kind of thing of I'm ruminating on that. I'm dwelling on that same narrative and I'm in the prison. They're not here with me. And I remembered it was sapping my energy in that season from creating the new thing that God had. I only have a certain amount of energy and I was spending it all on complaining. And when I complain, I can't create. And the God that created me in His image is a creator. Not obviously a complainer. We often do that. But it was just, it was so helpful because it was always these moments where Holly would just be like, how's how's that working out for you? Psalm 77 says, I complained and my spirit was overwhelmed. And so I think so many times the reason we are feeling overwhelmed is because we've spent so much time complaining, or at least I feel like that's for me. And so when we begin, the opposite of complaining is being grateful. And so if we can find something to be grateful for, and it says, Paul writes, give thanks in all situations for this is the will of God, right? Being grateful is God's will. So what an amazing thing that you can be in God's will. So by being grateful. Complaining is really just entitlement. It's me thinking I deserve something better. And that's convicting because who am I to say that I deserve something better? I know, but that's (laughs) Sheila read the scripture. (laughs) I know, I liked you before that comment. I know. I'm I'm sitting here convicted yeah, because right. I think that when I am complaining, it's me thinking I deserve something better and yeah. telling God, this is this is not right. I deserve better. And who am I to say that? But I love that that's what Paul says at the beginning. Um, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Yeah. And it's like I fall so far short of that. I was thinking about that the other day because I'm writing a new book on on heaven and thinking, you know, I fall so far short of, because I, I wanted to read everything Jesus said to his closest friends again, knowing that he knows what's about to happen and they don't. Right. And they're going to think everything's fallen apart and nothing's worked and it's all been a disaster. And and then he goes on to say um, that he's gone to prepare a place for us. Mm-hmm. Don't let your hearts be troubled. And I have to keep reminding myself, this isn't it. Yeah. You know, we're just, this is just the tuning up of the orchestra before right. the curtains open and and we start to really live. And when when I can have that attitude, then it changes everything. Philippians is absolutely dripping with joy. If you haven't read it in a while, I'd really encourage you to just read straight through it. It And the interesting thing is Paul's in prison. I mean, he's literally chained to a Roman guard while he's writing all about this joy. But then you see why. If you come to Philippians chapter two, there's this beautiful passage where it tells us to have the same mind that is in Christ Jesus. And it talks about the way that he gave up all his rights to come down to this earth and to pay the price for everything, every wrong thing that Sheila Walsh has ever done. He's paid for everything that you have ever done. And he did it because he he loves us. If there was anyone on the earth who would honestly have said, well, this is not my job, it would have been Jesus. But he gladly embraced that so that you and I could know what it's like to be loved by our Father. Like we can go to God with our broken heart, with our pain. He can handle that. Yeah. I and and David did that so well. He would go to God with everything he was feeling, yeah. but he always came back to rehearsing his trust in God. Yeah. But I will praise yes. you. But yeah. God, you will yeah. save me. Yeah. And I think that's what we could get better at. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, there was a uh, just a time 
for us when I felt like fight one fight at a time. Right. Mm -hmm. yes. But when they all come, yes. oh, it just yeah. never happens like that, right? So this is just a season that, and that, which I've talked about in the show, just like with my dad dying and yeah. Philip getting cancer and then just dealing with the my daughter making some horrible choices that as a mother, you're going, what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the betrayal of people. And so, and because I'm peopley, as you know, I could probably, it's easier for me to handle a financial loss emotionally than it is a people loss. I remember sitting on my couch and um, angry and complaining and, and I could feel like bitterness mm -hmm. and not just like a root, but a tree is happening. It's just like wow. bitter. And so Philip, who's the Christian in our marriage, <laughs> he comes down and he said, he puts a jar in our kitchen and he said, every day we're going to come down and instead of you complaining about what's been happening, and he's dealing with cancer, so I, I should listen to him, right? And he said, instead of you complaining, we're going to write something that we're grateful for and put it in this jar. That's so good. And I said, no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you. You, you do this. And then he got me all these colorful post-it notes because that's going to help motivate me. Right. Be inspiring. And so I came down and I, the first day I'm looking at that ridiculous jar yeah. and I'm mad yeah. and I'm complaining about the jar. It's the best jar you can get. <laughs> yeah. And then I'm complaining about my husband. And, yes. and so I'm looking at that jar and I don't want to be doing this. And, but I know he's going to look. And so I pick up one of those post-it notes and I'm like, what am I thankful for? Coffee. Yeah. Hey. Amen. Yep, that'll work. Right? That'll yep. work. And so then the next day I go down and I have nothing. There's nothing. I got nothing. I'm still angry, still complaining. But I made the decision. Coffee. And I'm pretty sure it was coffee for about five days. Yeah. <laughs> and then um, one day I came down and it was like, oh, sunshine. As if that was unusual in yeah. Southern California, right? So sunshine. And then within, I don't know, a few weeks, then it was my house and wow. my family and it. You know, I slowly put other things in there, but there wasn't a moment when I felt grateful. That's great. I just made the decision, yes. the decision to be grateful. There wasn't yeah. one moment right. when I went, Woohoo, I'm so grateful. Right. No, it was a decision to be grateful. Yeah. And I feel like I did that every day until something broke in me. Yeah. Until then it just became an ease. Yeah. Yeah. And so I feel like just as a practical way to stop complaining, if we would make the decision yeah. to find something to be sure. grateful for. Yeah, and I don't know what people, some, some people can keep a journal and be grateful. Good for you. Do that. But maybe it's starting your day with thinking of one thing that you're thankful for today. Right. Right. But just, it has to be a discipline because it's never right. going to be a feeling. Right. Right. And yeah. if you yeah. wait till you feel so grateful, you won't do it. Right. Yeah. So it's making the decision. And that's yeah. what broke it for me. Okay. And, and in that, in that time, I feel like the spirit of God showed me who that bitter old woman would become. Wow. And I saw this picture of a woman I didn't want to be. Yeah. And so I knew I needed to do this. When I think about what I can replace complaining with, because, you know, if we want to get rid of something, we can't just get rid of it and then that void is there in our life. We have to replace it with something. Otherwise, let me tell you right now, the enemy and the world and just life, that'll, that'll fill that void for you. So we want to be intentional about it. And I think back to when the Israelites were crossing over and God parted the seas and He told Joshua to take 12 stones and create a memorial for what they had walked through. Why? It wasn't just because they wanted to build a pretty little monument or an art gallery. They weren't having an art exhibition. They had a couple other things that they needed to do. It was so that the next time they wondered if God was going to come through, they could remember what God had already done. And so I think for me, when I'm tempted uh, to complain on the daily. <laughs> it's not just always gratitude, a simple gratitude moment. I understand the deeper meaning behind the simple exercise. And I need you to understand that too. We're not just talking about find three things to be grateful for and you'll never complain again. I wish it was that simple. What it's doing is it's creating a muscle in us of just like the Israelites of remembering the faithfulness of God. He has been faithful today because He was faithful yesterday. And because He was faithful yesterday, I know He's gonna be faithful tomorrow. And while we're in the in-between, we'll remember all the ways that He's already parted the sea and calmed the storm and brought us through the fire. So that rather than complaining, I'm just thanking God in the waiting. 
waiting is really active and it's tempting to complain while we're waiting, but that will just make the waiting season feel claustrophobic. Why not remember all the ways that God already has come through for you and find some things to be grateful for today. I know it's a simple exercise, but it has really, really, really big results. It was a year later I was walking through my divorce and I remembered that story because it's not just for us. Right. People are watching. I had seen a photo of my ex-husband and he was out living his actual best life. And I was mad. I was so mad because here I was doing the work, far away, frustrated, mad. God, why? And I felt like the Holy Spirit told me to go to the beach or maybe that was me. Could have been both. Drive down to the beach. I'm sitting on the beach and I remember Holly's story and I felt this, what are you grateful for? Because if you don't find something to be grateful for right now, this is about to take over. And it was that same wrestle. I don't want, it It was almost overwhelming, this like, I don't want to do this. But I remembered you telling that story and I had watched you do that. And I was like, okay. And so I did my own version of what you just explained. And I felt that same thing. Something in me broke open. The hard shell broke and there were tears, but there was a softness inside. And I think if we're all honest, complaining, anger, madness, grumbling, it's all protecting disappointment. Yes. Yeah. But if we let God see that Mm -hmm. with Thanksgiving, presenting those requests to God, then the peace of God. That's what comes. And I think that point, to make that point of it, it wasn't just for you because I was watching. I was watching what happened. What do you do when all the fights are coming at you, when all the fires are there? Yeah. People, it's not just for people are watching. Yeah. That's that's a real good point because yeah. if you realize that your life is just not about you yeah. and yeah. about others, yeah. it'll give you more accountability. Yeah. We can't see God. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We know God is yeah. real. We know God exists, but we serve God by serving one another. Mm-hmm. And yeah. if I can serve you by how I live my life, yeah. what I say out of my mouth, how I do things, how yeah. I think, then yeah. I'm going to think before I act because yeah. I know somebody else is watching my life mm-hmm. and I don't ever want to be a stumbling block to someone else. Right. I'm not saying at the expense of ignoring what's going on with yeah. me and handling things, but I'm going to be more mindful of those things yeah. Yeah. and to walk myself mm-hmm. through processes. Yeah. I love how yeah. you did that and you just said it's yeah. about a decision yeah. Yeah. because, you know, they had this song. It's like every time I feel the spirit, I will pray. Well, I probably wouldn't pray half the time. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? If you're waiting to feel it. If I'm waiting to yeah. feel it, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I right. just don't feel yeah. it. Sometimes you wake up in the morning, you don't feel like praying, right. but you understand your responsibility yeah. to pray. Yeah. I don't feel like getting up, going to church. I would like to stay home too sometimes <laughs> and watch on Zoom like everybody yeah. else. <laughs> Let me tune in on Facebook. Yes. But I have a responsibility yeah. to the word yeah. to fail not to yeah. assemble myself together. Mm-hmm. And so if we live our life based upon the leadership of the spirit of God opposed yeah. to how we feel, yeah. we can get through things. But I love that when you yeah. say it's about a decision. Yeah. And yeah. then for you to say, let me just decide mm-hmm. to be grateful about something, I think that's what begins to break up that, you know, that hard shell and say, hey, I still have a heart in there. Making the decision to be grateful, uh, is it's not about feeling it. I mean, if someone gives you a big fat present, you probably feel grateful. But there have been many situations I've been in where I just had to choose to be grateful for. And I talked about in the show today, just about a series of really horrible situations that I was in the middle of. And I had to make a decision to be grateful. I, I had to choose it every day, walk down. And I never felt it. There was never like this, ooh, gratitude, pink fuzzy cloud that descended. No, I had to choose every day to be grateful. And you know, the circumstances didn't change. I still was navigating cancer with my husband. My daughter was still, in the middle of a really tricky situation. We were still processing this financial loss and I was still trying to grieve the loss of my dad. So the the circumstances didn't necessarily change, but I changed. Instead of just this bitter, angry woman, which that's who I was becoming, I just began to trust God more and realize my life is in His hands and I'm choosing to find something today that I can be thankful for. It, It was a game changer and I just suggest that you do the same. Find something to be thankful for. And and let me just say, I'm not actually trying to downplay 
whatever pain you might be in. So whether it's navigating cancer yourself or navigating cancer with a loved one or you've lost someone or you've lost a job. So I'm not trying to downplay any of those at all. They're all horrible, horrible, painful situations. I'm just saying that's what they are. So then what are you gonna do? How can you rise in the midst of that? And one of the ways that we can rise and get through it is to find something to be thankful for, whatever that is. For me, I was thankful for coffee for a lot of days. I was thankful for coffee and then chocolate and find something, just something that you can be thankful for to help shift your focus. There's a there's an old movie. I don't know if you guys remember this or watched it. Please tell me you have. It's called Pollyanna. Oh, have, yeah. you, have any of you seen? Yeah, okay, heard, this is a I've homework assignment. You have to watch okay, Pollyanna. Okay. It's with Haley Mills. and oh, um, Old, old movie. Old, old movie, yeah. And I'll never forget, um, I watched it growing up, but our, my youth pastor growing up, he used to make all of the leadership in our church sit down and watch Pollyanna. I'm not kidding. And the reason is, is because, long story short, this little girl has been raised, her parents are were missionaries, so she's been raised on the mission field. And when they had nothing, when they, when they didn't have food to eat, and they didn't have toys to play with. Her parents taught her to play the glad game. And so the whole story continues on with this little girl going into a new environment. Her parents have passed away and she's living with new family. But every time she faces a negative scenario, she plays the glad game and it's obnoxious. To everyone around her, they're like, what is wrong with you? Why does everything have to be positive? But the point of the story was that she had just made a decision. She'd learned this life lesson. I won't give the whole movie away. She'd learned this life lesson that no matter what the situation was, there's something we can find to be glad about. Mm -hmm. There's some way that we can reframe or reshape that thought and that feeling and choose to be glad. And so I, that's always been a reminder to me. It's just, it's the same as gratitude, right? It's playing the glad game. Yeah. Well, I may be frustrated that it's raining today, but we can be glad that the the water is gonna make the plants grow Good. and they're gonna be beautiful. Yeah. You know, whatever it might be, you just figure it out. Yeah. And maybe it seems weird at the, at the start. Maybe it feels silly. It does. But better to feel silly. Yep than to sit in the complaining. Yeah. And I think yeah. that's what I, because at first I always feel like, oh man, but so, maybe that's so superficial. It's just yeah. like, that's not going to fix my life. Okay. But this isn't either. Yeah. Like yeah. neither is the complaining. And yeah. I've been around people because I tend to reframe really easily. It's just part of my, my personality. I, I, it just, it just comes natural to me. It's how am I going to find the positive mm -hmm. in this situation? Mm -hmm. And I, I've gotten discouraged in that before because I've had so many people around me that have been like, why do you wow. always have to make everything positive? Mm -hmm. And at first I thought, well, am I doing something wrong? But but then I started looking at the fruit of the lives of the people who were wow. so frustrated with me and they were miserable and they were grumpy and they were bitter. And I thought, well, I don't want that. Right. I'd rather choose to yeah. look at, for something positive and yeah. something to be celebrated because I'd rather experience joy than bitterness. You know, it takes intentionality to really make sure that our words are life-giving to those around us. I think specifically to the people that we're the closest with. The people we're the closest to sometimes get more of our criticism than they do our encouragement. And so I would just encourage you, if that's you, take the time daily to surrender your words to God, to say, God, here I am today. Would you use me to encourage the people that you've placed in my world? Would you give me the right words to say? Would you help me find something that I can tell them that's amazing about them, something that I love about them? If you just begin to use that as the filter through which you see people, God, help me to find something that I love about them, something I can encourage them with. God will give you the right words to share. And I'm telling you those words will actually shape the trajectory of the lives of the people that you come in contact with. Sometimes the situation I can get stuck. If something like, you know, you're stuck in that room for 14 days and it's like, well, what do I do here? How do I do what this book tells me to do? I find so much help in the way that Christ processed his pain mm -hmm. in that last yeah. day. Because, you know, when you read the accounts in the, diff in the gospels of how honest Jesus was that night. I mean, when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane right. with his closest, he didn't say, well, you know, Father, this was always the plan. Let's do this. You know, I get <laughs> right, it. You know, right. let's, he was, I mean, he was in so much pain that he literally sweat blood. Luke mm -hmm. tells us that he's the one that's a doctor, which still happens today. It's called hematohydrosis. Oh. I looked it up and the place that it shows up occasionally is when people have been walked to the execution. Yeah. It's like intense. Yeah agony. 
And so I, when I look at that, that helps me so much because I think Christ processed his pain in the presence of his father. Right. He told them, he, so it's like in the hotel room, yes. it's like, I yes. hate this, this is awful. But when you pour all out in the presence of your father, yeah, yes. you make space for grace, yeah, yeah. which is what happened to Jesus. Yeah. The angels came and they ministered mm-hmm. to him. Mm-hmm. I had a thing earlier this year where I, I thought I'd broken my neck and it was terrifying. And I had wow. spent 18 hours in the ER and MRIs and CAT scans and, and I remember I'm kind of claustrophobic, so being in that oh, machine yeah. was, and I couldn't open my eyes because I, I thought if I open my eyes and I see how close that thing is to my face, I'm right. not going to do well. But that's what I thought, that's what I remembered that night. It was like, okay, Lord, I did not see this coming, but you did. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm going to tell you everything. Yeah. I, I don't want to be paralyzed. I don't want this. I mean, yeah. I just literally poured it all wow. out. But there's something about when you do it in the presence of your father. Yeah. Rather than just, I'm over here complaining. Yeah. No, I'm on my knees no, here well, complaining. That's the, that's, that's the difference. That's actually, that's a really good mm-hmm. point because I feel like sometimes we complain to people. Yeah, people. The best is complaining to God. And there's yeah. plenty of times he would say to me, why aren't you talking to me about this first? Mm-hmm. But I've also found myself telling people because I'm trying to get them to either have some sympathy yeah. or co- whatever it is. Be on, your side. Be on my Misery side. Loves company, right? Misery loves somebody. Right. And it's not, it's not helpful. Yeah. No. And then I've tried, I've actually tried to share a situation with somebody a wise person, and then they're offering me counsel, but I'm so stubborn. I'm so <laughs> stuck in my complaining <laughs> that I'm not doing what they're saying to do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it, it doesn't help. Yeah. Right. None of it helps. So yeah. I just think being, you have to be really careful about the people that we yes. share. Yeah. Share. I'm not, I, you should share it with somebody. Yeah. yeah. Somebody that'll go, stop mm-hmm. that. Yeah. Get or I get you, again. do this instead yeah. or something. Come on, get up. I think one of the great internal debates is when you're walking through something or something's really bothering you or someone's hurt you or you don't understand, you know, who do you talk to? Obviously, we know that as believers, we don't want to be gossips. And I think you can tell the difference when you're sharing something just to to show somebody else in a bad light. That's one thing. We probably don't want to go there. But there's also a place for, it says in Galatians that we should bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And that means if you're going through something that's really, that has hurt you, find someone that you trust. Find a sister, find a brother that you can share that with so that they can pray for you because some things are too much to carry by yourself. But also know this, you can always take everything to the Father. And sometimes, sometimes that's the first place to start because sometimes your emotions initially are so raw. If you're really angry or you feel betrayed, sometimes you want to pour that out on the Lord, first of all, knowing that He will receive you. But then find somebody you trust that you can share those parts with so that they can pray for you. I was reading a few nights ago about this beautiful painting that hangs, hangs in the National Gallery in London. And it's by a very famous Italian guy whose name I don't remember. But an art critic was looking at it. And it's a picture of Mary holding the, the infant Jesus. And the art critic's looking at it and saying, this is all wrong. The angles are wrong. The light is wrong. There's nothing about this picture. He spent hours just staring. There's nothing about this picture that's right. And then the kind of curator was coming through the museum and said to him, what do you think of the painting, sir? And he said, it's, it's, it's wrong. It's just, there's nothing about this that's right. And the curator said, do you want to know where this painting came from? And he said, yeah. He said, it came from a chapel. It's supposed to be in a room of prayer. He said, oh, why wow. don't you kneel down and look at the painting? <gasps> oh, And the guy yes. knelt down in the National Gallery oh, and looked up at the painting. It was perfect. It was perfect. Oh, that there's some wow. things you're only going to see when you're on your knees. Because otherwise, you're standing up, yes. it looks all wrong. Okay. All wrong. <laughs> That's, I'm doing a lap. I'm doing a lap. Uh, me yeah. too. Yeah. I'm running. <laughs> see love. <laughs> Yeah. Wow. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. yeah. That is. Isn't that wow. so interesting? Yeah. The yeah. angle that you can be looking mm. at, you're so it's so easy to yeah. critique. Yeah. So I think that's so powerful is it's like God's not a God that's like, don't tell me your problems. No. He's like, come to me. Jesus said, come to me. Yeah. You tired? Are you worn out? You yeah. burnt out on re- religious rituals that don't yeah. give you any peace, the Amplified mm-hmm. says. Jesus said, come to Him. So He wants us to pour his, our heart out to Him but with the right posture, with the right perspective on it Mm -hmm. so that it's not like, God, here's all my problems. It's God, can you help me carry this? And the second that we can release ourselves of the weight of grief, of the weight of the world, suddenly we don't need the complaining. We don't need the people that we're always venting to that justify it. Because I think to your point too, it's so powerful. And maybe the reasons so many of my stories are with you is because 
I have done so many things wrong or I wish I had done things differently so many times. But one of the things that I did know to do was I knew that at least there was a handful of women in my life that would give me a right perspective. Because even though I was in my moments of stupid, (laughs) I knew that there would be another perspective on the other side. And and so I think sometimes, and maybe that's for someone watching, it's like they don't know how to get out of that cycle of complaining. Maybe today, talk to the Father. Yeah, first. Come to Him. Yeah. And then come to someone that you trust hears the voice of the Holy Spirit. You know, I think sometimes we're searching to find this healthy balance between bringing our complaints to God and our requests to God. and, And what does that look like? without complaining all the time and focusing on the negative all the time. And and here's what I would tell you. God can handle whatever you're walking through. And I would just encourage you that He's the first place you should go when you're struggling, when you're feeling hurt, when you're feeling disappointed, when you're angry. I'm telling you, He can handle your anger. So I don't know that looking for the healthy balance with God is the key because God can handle it. But when you go to Him and you you tell Him all of your concerns and you share with Him all of your thoughts, here's what I would encourage you to do. After you've said it all, sit back and listen because the Spirit of God will speak to you. He will encourage you. He'll speak life over you. He'll remind you of His goodness. He'll remind you of His promises. He'll remind you who He says you are. But in order to get there, we have to stop talking. <laughs> so the, that would be the healthy balance that I would consider is that we we can bring anything to God, any complaint, any frustration, any hurt, we can bring it to Him. But after you've brought it and you've dumped it out there, we do what David did in the book of Psalms and we say, but God, I will trust you, but God, I will wait on you. And then we quiet our souls and we listen because it's in those listening moments that the Spirit of God will lean in and will encourage your heart in ways that you could never encourage yourself. I remember being mad at my husband going to sleep at times. Don't judge me, don't judge me. No judgment here. And then I would wake up in the morning and I would have to remind myself of why I was mad at him. (laughs) I was like- Don't wanna let go of this. Yeah. (laughs) It was the craziest thing. It's like, so why were you mad last night? Let me think about it before I opened my eyes. <laughs> you so know, like I was though. mad and I couldn't think of it. It was like, <laughs> ugh, it just was crazy. <laughs> and then I don't have to let it go because I couldn't even remember. So it's like some things we magnify, right. it shouldn't even have weight in our life. Yeah. And if you take it to the Father, He'll be able to instruct you, okay, go and get some help. Yeah. Because He does assign people to our lives yeah. that will um, help us carry certain things. He says, mm-hmm. to confess your faults to one another so yeah. you can be healed. So we should yeah. be able yeah. to depend and go to, you know, one another. But some stuff, it's like... Yeah. Man, grow up. Get yourself together. You okay. You got this. <laughs> you know, once you talk to the Father, because yeah, he's, right. he's going to yeah, be right. totally honest with us. Yeah. I've often found that when I'm complaining, it's covering this thing I really want to bring to the Father. Ah. I'm just afraid to. <laughs> and I'll never forget the day that my marriage fell apart and my husband left and my dad had flown in from Australia he had probably called Philip and Holly and was like, all right, I'm coming over. <laughs> and so he's there and and the thing is starting to unravel. And we had decided together that it might be good for me to go to Australia for a few months to get some good therapy and, and um, be able to grieve and just process and stuff. And um, I remember him being there and the last thing I had to do was pack up my apartment. You couldn't get me to not be mad at the people around me for a second. Yeah. I was mad. I was just angry. I was mad. And because it was covering this need of, I'm so hurt. Yes. And I remember my dad asking me, do you want me to come and help you pack up the apartment? And I was embarrassed. I was like, no, it's fine. He's already left me. All these complaining terms, grumbling, and I'm fine. I'll do it myself. And he said, are you sure I can come and help you? And I said, no, dad, I'm fine. I was embarrassed, covering it with grumbling, covering it with madness. And so I finished packing up the apartment And I remember being in the living room, staring at all of my suitcases. And have you ever been in a moment where it's not that you can't physically leave the room, but you know the second that you do, what's happened becomes real? Yeah. yeah. Like what's happening, it's real. And I knew I couldn't actually carry the weight. I couldn't carry my luggage out. And I knew I had to call my dad. My dad that I'd been complaining to for so long. I called him and he said, I'll be right there. He comes to my apartment 
takes my hand, leads me to the balcony, prays over me, takes spiritual ownership back over me, closes the season and says, come on, babe, let's go home. And my dad picked up the suitcases, gave me my handbag and said, let's go. And as we were walking down the hallway, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, at least take a photo of this. You're going to want to remember it. And that is the photo that I show whenever I'm speaking to a group of women because there's my dad in front of me with all of my baggage yeah. and I'm walking behind him with my little handbag. And I think if we understood that that was the father heart of God, yeah. it would be less about complaining and more about calling on him because yes. he's not mad. Yes. He's not there to punish us. Yeah. He's not going to tell us to suck it up. Yeah. Right. He's going to take the weight and lead the way home. Yeah. So I think so maybe good. as we're so wrapping good. up, yeah. Maybe we can just pray that people would feel afresh today, the Father's heart. Because if they understood the Father, yep. it'd be more about, Dad, can you yeah. help me? Rather than so complaining. Yep. I love so that. Can we, Powerful. Could we pray? Yeah, yeah, that's great. Father, I just thank you so much that your heart is for your, your children. You love us so much. And I pray for every single person that it feels like they're carrying the weight of the world on their shoulders today. Father, would you remind them that you created the world yes. and you never asked them to carry it? Yes. And God, where we have moments in our own life at the moment where it feels easy to complain or grumble, would you remind us either what's underneath or what you have called us to give us things to be grateful for? Show us the world that you have put us in. And Lord, in those moments where maybe we're protecting ourselves with anger to cover some some sadness, as we unload on you today, I thank you that you can handle it. I pray that you would fill those places with peace, with joy, with love, where there is miracles. I pray there'd be miracles and more than anything today. Father, I pray that we would feel your heart for us, how much you love us. And for that, we can be so grateful. We are so grateful. In Jesus' name, name. amen. Amen. You know, it's been a lifelong process to learn to replace negative self-talk with the truth of God's Word. But what I've learned to do is to actually memorize the Word of God. The Bible says to take the Word of God and hide it within your heart. And so I would just encourage you, if you're struggling with insecurity, if you are struggling with always listening to the voices in your head that make you feel inferior, inadequate, that make you feel just ashamed or not good enough, I would just encourage you to actually dig into the Word of God and to memorize some of the scriptures of what God says about you. When you learn those scriptures, then every single time those thoughts come that tell you, I'm not good enough, I, I, I don't fit in, that tell you, you don't even know what you're, what you're talking about. If you will in those moments say, nope, that's not what I'm going to think about right now. I'm going to choose the truth of God's Word. And if you've memorized the Scripture, or even if you've written it down, you can go to the Word of God and you can say it out loud and speak the truth of God's Word over your life, and it will begin to shift your perspective. Hi, I'm Sheila, and I'm here with Didi, and we're going to answer your questions. So, Didi, let me start with you. Rosie messaged us on Instagram, and here's what she asked. How do you know when your thoughts are of God and when your thoughts are of the flesh? Wow. Wow. You really, to me, won't realize if your thoughts are of God or of your flesh unless you know the Word. That's good. You have to know the Word of God because that's what would be the defining factor in order to know. But then again, you know, even if your thoughts are the Word, I always say if we are one, God is in me and I'm in Him, the devil is not going to tell you to think like God. That's true. So if I'm having a godly thought, Mm -hmm. it has to be God. Absolutely. Hope that answered your question, Rosie. I hope so. I first realized that my voice mattered and it could be used to bring glory to God. Honestly, when I was a little girl. Now that doesn't mean that I've always remembered it because there's certainly been times when I've forgotten it. And I think that's a lifelong journey. But if I look back on my life, my parents raised me to understand that with great royalty comes great responsibility. And they raised me in a home that told me who I was, that I was the daughter of a king. And so since I was a little girl, I knew that my voice carried weight simply because 
I was created in the image of God. So along the way, there's definitely been times where I've had seasons where I felt silenced or, or where shame has caused my voice to feel suffocated or claustrophobic. But every single time I've been reminded of who I am, what I have to say comes naturally and it comes with a weight. You know, two people can say the same thing and it feels different because they carry a different weight. And for me, I don't remember a specific moment but I think for that, I'm really grateful that I've just always known that whose I am, that that meant that I had something to say.